When the term modern philosophy is used in universities, it's usually to make a distinction from ancient and medieval philosophy. So it doesn't mean just the philosophy of our own day here in the 20th century. It means the Frenchman Descartes. So in practice, what the term modern philosophy means is philosophy from Descartes onwards. René Descartes was born in France in 1596. He received an unusually good education, but he also had unusual independence of mind. And while still young, he perceived that the various authorities he was studying quite often put forward arguments that were invalid. As a young man, he became a soldier and traveled widely in Europe, though without seeing any fighting. And he was struck by the fact that the world of practical life was as full of contradictions as the world of books. He became fascinated by the question whether there was any way at all in which we human beings could get to know anything for certain. And if so, how? He stopped traveling and went into seclusion in Holland, the country in which intellectual life in those days was at its freest. There, during the 20 years from 1629 to 1649, he produced work of the profoundest originality in mathematics and philosophy, and also did a great deal of work in science. He invented the branch of mathematics known as coordinate geometry. It was his idea to measure the position of a point by its distance from two fixed lines. So every time we look at a graph, we are looking at something invented by Descartes. In fact, those two familiar lines on a graph are known by his name. They are called Cartesian coordinates, Cartesian being the adjective from the name Descartes. His most famous works of philosophy are The Discourse on the Method, which was published in 1637, and The Meditations, published in 1642. He never married, though he had an illegitimate daughter who died at the age of five. He always had an eye to his own dress, was proud of being an officer, and on the whole preferred the company of men of affairs to that of scholars. But during the years of his creative work, he lived a very solitary life. When he was 54, he was prevailed on by Queen Christina of Sweden, rather against his will, to go to Stockholm and become her tutor in philosophy. It was a mistake. In the bitter Swedish winter, he succumbed to pneumonia, and he died in the following year, 1650. With me to discuss the work of this first of modern philosophers, is the Provost of King's College, Cambridge, Bernard Williams, author of a well-known book on Descartes. Bernard Williams, I think the best way we can begin is to try and get clear in our minds what it was that Descartes thought was the main problem he was going to have to confront when he started. Now, what was that? I think he'd been impressed by the education you referred to and his experience of the life around him with the idea that there was no certain way of acquiring knowledge. It looked as if there were some sorts of knowledge around, but there was no reliable method by which people could advance knowledge. I think it's very important, that, to put it in a historical context, that one realizes that science, in our sense, really didn't exist. I mean, the concept of science, in our sense, as an organized international enterprise with research methods and laboratories and all that, simply didn't exist. And there was room for an enormous range of opinions about what chances there might be of ever being on a science, uh, of there being a science. I mean, on the one hand, there were people, and perfectly sensible people, who thought that if you just found the right fundamental method, you could solve all the fundamental problems of understanding nature in a very short while. For instance, Francis Bacon, the English statesman, thought that, that you'd be able to get everything on the right road in a very brief uh, period. On the other hand, there were people, skeptical people, who thought you couldn't find any knowledge at all, that there wasn't going to be any knowledge, that it, everything was up for grabs, as it were. I think one particular reason, it's quite important actually, why there was so much skepticism around, was actually a result of the religious reformation. That after the religious reformation, there were all sorts of claims made about how you found out religious truth, and they all conflicted with one another, and there was no way of deciding between them. And that gave rise to a tremendous amount of controversy, in which people said, and enemies of all religions said, well, there simply isn't a way of solving any of these questions. All these people disagree with each other. You can't put it on the foundation. And then religious people, sort of reacting against that, in turn said, well, religion's no different in this from anything else. There isn't a way of putting anything on a firm foundation. So that skepticism was quite an important current in the intellectual climate of Descartes' time, coexisting in an odd way 
with very extravagant hopes of what science might be able to do, and for instance, might be able to do for mankind through what we would now call technology. For instance, there were great hopes that there could be a scientific medicine and a scientific industry and so on, but nobody quite knew how to do it. For a fundamental innovator like Descartes, the institutional setup must have presented problems too, mustn't it? I mean, almost yes. every serious institution of learning or study or teaching was in the hands of an authoritarian church whose own intellectual leaders were for the most part in thrall to ancient authority. That is, that is certainly true. Of course, there were, there were many different religious in, uh, influences, as, um, as we just said. I mean, that one effect of the Reformation had been that some seats of learning had more of a Protestant comple complexion, while obviously those in Descartes' own Paris had a Catholic uh, complexion and so on. But of course, the point you mentioned about authority is very important. Although there had been a good deal of research into what we would now call mechanics or kind of mathematical physics in the Middle Ages, and we shouldn't forget that fact, a great deal of what was, would go by the way of being science was actually in the form of commentary on ancient books, above all, though not exclusively those of Aristotle. And one thing that Descartes and others of his generation absolutely knew was that historical authority was not the same thing as, as it were, first order research or inquiry. So in other words, what one can say is that Descartes, in starting out on his famous search for certain mm -hmm. knowledge, was really looking for a way of moving forward from the situation that you've just outlined. I mean, he was yes. looking for a research program, as we might say in modern parlance, and prior to that, a research method. Yes, I think that, uh, that's, that's a perfectly correct description of the situation. It's very important that one further fact which conditions all of his work, and which one finds in the thread through it, was that Science was not conceived as a shared or joint or organized enterprise as it is now. For us, it's just taken for granted that science means scientists. There are a lot of people, and they communicate with each other, and there's a division of labor, a division of intellectual labor. At that time, in the first half of the 17th century, it was still a reasonable project for one man to have the idea that he could lay the foundations of all future science. And Descartes, who did really fundamentally believe that, it was not, as it were, a piece of megalomaniac insanity on his part, as it would be in the modern world for anybody who had that idea. Now, in my introduction to this discussion, I said that Descartes became fascinated by the question of whether there was anything that we could know for certain. Yes. He was clear from the outset, wasn't he, that certainty and truth are not the same thing, and that the, I mean, to put it at its yes. uttermost crudity, uh, <clears throat> certainty is a state of mind. The truth is, relates to the way things are out there yes, yes, in sure. the world. Yeah. Uh, uh, but he seems to have thought that uh, you could only be uh, know that you've got yeah. the truth, so to speak, if you also had grounds for certainty. So that his method was not only going to have to be one which delivered the goods in the form of worthwhile conclusions, yes. but also gave him a way of defending them against sceptical arguments. Mm. So Now, how did he go about meeting that double-barreled requirement? Yes. Well, Descartes had a set of conditions on inquiry, um, and some of them were just sort of sensible rules about dividing questions up into handleable amounts, trying to get your ideas clear and things like that. But he had got this very characteristic and important rule for him that you shouldn't accept as true anything about which you could entertain the slightest doubt. Now, of course, as you said, on the face of it, that isn't an immediately sensible rule, because in ordinary life, we're constantly seeking true beliefs about things, but we don't necessarily want to make those beliefs as certain as possible. One thing, we'd have to invest too much effort into making the ultimate, you know, ultimately certain beliefs all the time. But Descartes, who was trying to get at the foundations of science, and also, not only at the foundations of the science itself, in the sense of fundamental general truths about the world, but also to lay the foundations of inquiry, that is to be able, as he thought, to lay the foundations of the possibility of going on to find out more things, to establish that scientific knowledge was actually possible. For him, he felt that it was absolutely essential that you should start the search for truth with a search for certainty. That what he wanted to do was to be able to put the scientific enterprise, as we would put it, into a shape in which it could no longer be attacked by skeptics. So the first thing he wanted to do was to engage in a kind, we might call it, preemptive skepticism. In order to put the foundations of knowledge beyond skeptical reach, 
he said to himself, I will do everything the sceptics can do, only better. And what I can do by pressing the sceptical inquiry hard enough is, he hoped, come out the other side with something which would be absolutely foundational and rock hard. And one of the most characteristic features of Descartes is not uh, that he confuses the idea of looking for truth and the idea of uh, looking for certainty. He saw they were two separate, separate things. But he thought that the only sure way of searching for truth was by starting for, uh, by searching for certainty. And that led him, didn't it, to <coughs> the famous Cartesian doubt yes. as a method, not, not the discourse on the method. That's, not, no, that's no. about something else. But, but doubt used as a method was fundamental to his procedure. Yes, he adopted it? something that he called the method of doubt. Yes. And indeed, the method of doubt mm -hmm. is part of the method which is discussed in the discourse on the method, but only one element in it. Yes. That's, the, that's the situation yes. there. Now, the method of doubt worked but since he was looking for certainty, by laying aside anything in which he could find a doubt. As he famously put it at one point, it's like having a barrel of apples, and some of them are bad and some of them are sound. You want to keep only the sound ones. So you take them all out first, look at them one by one, throw away the ones that are dubious, and put back only the absolutely sound ones. So he started by emptying his mind of all beliefs, laying aside anything in which he could see the slightest doubt. And the way he did that was really in three stages. He started by laying aside things which just on ordinary commonsensical grounds you might possibly find doubtful. For instance, he reminded himself of such well-known facts as sticks can look bent in water or, you know, things can look curious colours to you if you have defects of eyesight and certainly sort of obvious things. But he wanted to go beyond those absolutely sort of everyday kinds of doubt or grounds of doubt. And the next step he could was to entertain the idea that perhaps we could doubt that we were really awake and seeing things around us, as we ordinarily suppose. For instance, he just entertained the following thought. He had often dreamt that in the past that he was perceiving things. While he was dreaming, at the time he was dreaming, he uh, thought, just as he does now, that he was seeing people or tables or whatever around him. But of course, he woke up and found that was all an illusion. How could he be certain that at this very instant he wasn't dreaming? Well. That's an unnerving kind of sceptical consideration. It had been used by sceptics before, but he gave it an orderly and settled place in his inquiry. Now, of course, the dream doubt, the doubt based on the dream, does depend upon knowing something. It depends upon knowing that in the past you've sometimes woken up and found you were dreaming. I mean, it depends on the idea that you know something about the world. For instance, that sometimes you sleep, sometimes you wake, sometimes you dream and so on. He then took another step. He said, I will imagine, I will go to the most extreme doubt possible. I will imagine the idea of a malign spirit, sort of evil spirit, a malicious demon, as it's sometimes called in the literature, whose sole intent is to deceive me as much as he can. And then I put myself the following question. Suppose there were such a spirit. Is there anything he couldn't mislead me about? And this is, of course, is a pure thought experiment. It's an abstract thought experiment. We must emphasize that Descartes never meant this philosophical doubt to be a tool for everyday living. He makes that point over and over again. The, the, the method of doubt, in particular the fantasy or model of the evil spirit, is used only as a form of intellectual critique in order to winnow out his beliefs and see whether some are more certain than others. And of course, the ultimate uh, uh, purpose for his long-range strategy of winnowing away everything that he can possibly in any imaginable circumstances doubt, yes. is to find rock-hard, indubitable propositions, which can then function as the premises for arguments. Absolutely Isn't that right. so? Well, there's yes. two things. I mean, he yes. wants to find, he certainly wants to find rock-hard, indubitable propositions. Let's say the propositions which in some sense, which of course requires a bit of inquiry into what exactly is, cannot be doubted, which in some yes. sense cannot be doubted, which will yes. resist the doubt. Um, he wants them in part as premises of argument. He also wants them in some rather more general role as to provide a kind of background which will validate the methods of inquiry I was referring to before, and we perhaps can say something about how that works, yes. But now, after peeling away all imaginably doubtable propositions, yes. what are the utterly indubitable ones that he finally well, arrived Well, at? the famous thing that he arrived at, the, the, what the, some French commentators call the turning point of the doubt, is where the doubt has got to the end and it does a U-turn and he starts coming back again, constructing knowledge again, the point at which it stopped 
was the reflection that he was himself engaged in thinking. As he said, the malicious demon can deceive me as he will. He can never deceive me in this respect, namely to make me believe that I am thinking when I am not. Because if I have a false thought, well, that's a thought. So in order to have a deceived thought, I've got to have a thought, so it must be true that I'm thinking. And from that, Descartes uh, drew another conclusion, or he, at least he immediately associated with that another fundamental truth, namely that he existed. And so his fundamental first proposition, or two propositions really, was, I am thinking, therefore I exist, or cogito ergo sum in the Latin formulation, or as it's often called, the cogito. That's that proposition. It's worth making the point that he himself uh, made it clear that by thinking, he didn't just mean conceptual thought. No, no. He meant all forms of conscious awareness Experience. whatsoever. Absolutely right. Experience, feelings, etc. Et Cogito, in this <laughs> Latin formulation, equally for Descartes' French formulation, means all sorts of things like perceptions and pains and so on, not just... Uh, so it wouldn't term. be unfair to say that what he was saying was, I am consciously aware, therefore I know that I must exist. That's right. That's, yes. right. Yes. that's, 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 right. that's it. He does actually... In the great work called The Meditations, in which this is most carefully and elaborately set out, he does actually show a great deal of finesse in pushing the boundaries of the cogito forward step by step through various kinds of mental experience. But the sum of what he gets to is exactly that. Yes. Now, in the process of peeling away everything that can possibly be doubted in order to arrive at these fundamental, indubitable propositions, he himself has shown that from these fundamental propositions, nothing follows. That uh, although I am consciously aware, I may draw all sorts of false inferences about, sure. for example, the external sure. world or whatever it might yeah. be, from whatever the deliverances of my own consciousness are. So I'm conscious only, I mean, I can be sure only of the fact that I am having whatever immediate experiences it is I am having. I can't be absolutely certain of any inference I may make from that. Well, it depends on what sort of inference it is. Uh, what he thought was that the mere fact that I have the experience, as it were, of being confronted with this table, for instance, mm. doesn't guarantee the existence of that table. Mm. I mean, that was got rid of even at the dream state of the doubt. And of course, yeah. it's even more got rid of by our friend, mm. the malicious demon, who is uh, maybe I might just have this experience and nothing actually be there. So I can't immediately infer from my experience. What Descartes tries to do is to construct now a set of considerations which will enable him to put the world back. So it has to be, it has to be said straight away that the, the form in which the world is put back is rather different from that of common sense. We don't just, as it were, having moved all the furniture out of the attic in the course of the day, stuff it all back again in a totally unreconstructed form. We have a different view of the world when we reconstitute it than we did in our everyday common sense experience. And incidentally, we'll come to how he does that, but it's a very important fact about the method of doubt that that is so. Uh, it's extremely important, because sometimes, sometimes people talk about Descartes' doubt as if all he did, he had a kind of gratuitous doubt, and then sort of put the whole world back again afterwards. But it's very important that not only does he put it back for very special reasons, but that what he puts back has actually been subtly modified by an intellectual critique of how we can know things. Yeah. But now, how he puts yes, it back is Yes, the I was going to say, the point that I'm concerned to get at now is that he seems, in arriving at his indubitable propositions, to have painted himself into a in corner, corner. Yeah. because he's given himself yes. indubitable propositions, which he himself has shown at a previous stage of the inquiry, can't be used to infer any certain truth yes. about the existence of anything outside myself. Well, he, he, all he's seen at the earlier stage of the proceedings is that the most obvious way of inferring from them isn't valid. He's now going to give you a way which he claims is. Now, of course, some people think that this actually is a bit of a conjuring trick and that he actually tries to get himself out of the corner into which he's painted by the well-known hero of the thriller novel. You know, likely he threw off his bonds, but I mean, this is how it works. He, he, now, having, as you rightly say, got to the point at which he, it is only the contents of his consciousness which he is acquainted with. There's nothing else available to him. It's obvious if he's going to put the world back, he's got to do it entirely out of the contents of his consciousness. So he's got to find something in the contents of his consciousness which leads outside himself. And he claims that what this is is the idea of God. He discovers among the contents of his consciousness the conception of God. And he argues that this is unique 
among all the ideas that he has, among all the things that are in his mind, this alone is such that the mere fact that he has this idea proves that there is really something corresponding to it. That is to say, there really is a God. That's a very difficult one for many modern readers to follow, yes, isn't it? Yes. Of yes. course. In fact, he has two different arguments, both of which he uses in the meditations for doing this. One is an old medieval argument called the ontological argument, which is, uh, I think, perhaps we needn't spend time on. That is, that is, is a kind of logical puzzle, I think, a metaphysical puzzle, but it's, it's much less characteristic of Descartes. The one that's really characteristic of Descartes is the argument which says, I have this idea in my mind, but I see an absolutely intuitive necessary principle, which is the lesser cannot give rise to the greater. The lesser cannot be the cause of the greater. Now, my idea of God is the idea of an infinite thing. And although it's only an idea in itself, it's nevertheless the idea of an infinite thing. It involves the idea that I can conceive an infinite being. But no finite creature, as I know myself to be, could possibly have given rise to such an idea, the idea of an infinite being. It could only have been implanted in me by God himself, as he memorably puts it at one point, as the mark of the maker on his work. God, as it were, signed me by leaving in this infinite idea of God himself. When I reflect that the lesser cannot give rise to the greater in this way, I realize that since I have this idea of God, it can only be because there actually is a God who has created me. So he's then put in the position of founding our knowledge of the external world That's on right. a belief in the self-evidentness of the existence That's of God. Right. It's absolutely central. The, the, arg the next bit then goes that it, it works like this. He then says, I, the things I know about this God, I know that he exists, I know that he's omnipotent, I know that he created me, and I know that he is benevolent. These are, of course, all traditional Christian beliefs. Um, and because God created me and is benevolent, he is concerned as much with my intellectual welfare as with my moral welfare. And what that means is that if I do my bit and that's very important, and I clarify my ideas as much as I should, and I don't assent precipitately to things I haven't thought out properly, if I do my bit in that sense, then God will validate the things which I am then very strongly disposed to believe. Now, I find that however much criticism I make of my ideas, however carefully I think out what is involved in my beliefs about the physical world and all that kind of thing, although I can suspend judgment, doubt. I wouldn't have got to this point if I couldn't. But I can suspend judgment in this doubt. I do have a very strong tendency to believe that there is a material world there. And since I have this disposition, I've done everything in my power to make sure that my beliefs are not founded on error. Then God will, at the end, as it were, make sure that I am not fundamentally and systematically mistaken. That is, there is such a world. So, in other words, by ending up arguing in effect that the world of science is given to us by a God whose existence is self-evident mm. and whose benevolence is self-evident. He, so to speak, not so much answered the skeptics about science as jumped over them. I mean, he's well, bypassed them. Well, what somehow. he says is that he, it's absolutely essential to his position that he believes that these arguments that involve God will be assented to by any person of good faith who concentrates on them enough. That's absolutely essential. He, he cannot accept, it's, it would ruin his whole position if you accepted the idea that whether you believe in God is a matter of cultural or psychological upbringing and perfectly sensible people can disagree about whether there's a God or not, however hard they think about it. It is essential to Descartes that to deny the existence of God confronted with these arguments is as perverse and as totally in bad faith as it would be denied that twice two is four. And therefore, the idea is that if you lead the skeptic properly through it, and the skeptic is an honest man and is not just mouthing words or trying to impress, and you put these proofs before him, he must at the end assent. Now, people have not done this because they haven't thought hard enough, they haven't split it into... They haven't done it in an orderly manner. A lot of the skeptics are, in fact, fakes who simply go around making a rhetorical position, don't really think about it. But if you're in good faith and think hard enough about it, then you will come to see this truth. And then you cannot consistently deny the existence of the external world. That's what he believes. 
Now, one very important outcome which this set of arguments had was uh, that of positing a world which consists fundamentally of two different sorts of entities. There's the external world, which is, as it were, given to me by a god on whom I can rely. But there's me, who is observing this external world. And he made a great point, again, in this earlier stage of the argument, when he's stripping away all the propositions that he can possibly doubt, of saying that when he's considering himself and the nature of his self, he can even imagine himself existing without a body. That's right. Absolutely but right. he can't imagine himself uh, well, not having the, the thinking awareness. Yeah, that's the point about the I am thinking being indubitable. Right. Yes, that's right. So one consequence of that yeah. is that you get a, a world positive which yeah. consists on the one hand of thinking entities yeah. which are locationless and substanceless, and a world, a material world, which this thinking entity is thinking about or observing. And it's a world of observer and observed, mind and matter, uh, sure. spirit and material, yeah. Yeah. which has become built into the whole Western way of looking at it. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, but now, uh, Descartes' ultimate aim from the beginning has been to establish the project of science, or of what That's we right. would call science. That's it. The project of what we yeah. would call science. And by the arguments that you've outlined, he's now arrived at a certain view of the external world. That's right. Now, how is this external world to be treated scientifically? Now, that, that uh, remember I mentioned earlier that when God, we, through the help of God, we put the world back again, we didn't put back quite the same world that we've thrown away, that it's criticized in the process. And in our reflections, we come to the conclusion not only that it is an external world, the external world, just as my essence as a thinking thing is simply thought, the external world has an essence too, and that's simply extension. It simply it takes up space that it's susceptible to being treated by geometry and the mathematical sciences. All its, as it were, colorful aspects, I mean the fact that it's colored, that there are certain tastes and sounds, these are really subjective. They're on the mental side. They're subjective things that occur in consciousness which are caused by this physical, extended, geometrical world. He had an example, which I think it's worth mentioning. <coughs> it's a very good one, yeah. about a piece of wax. He said, if you take a piece of wax, it has a certain size and shape in your yeah. hand, a certain color, smell, texture, feel, temperature, and so on. And it seems to us to be the combination of those properties. If you put the same piece of wax in front of the fire, it immediately melts. And then all those things change. Yeah. Different color, different smell, yeah. different temperature, different everything. And yet we want to say it's the same wax. Now, what about it? what is there about it that's the same? Answer, I suppose, that there's a continuous history of space occupancy. Yes. It, there is, as you know, there is a great, uh, one of the disputed things in founding Descartes is what exactly he thought the wax argument proved and how much he thought it proved just by itself. But he certainly did use that example to illustrate, if not actually to prove, uh, what he thought was the fundamental idea, that is, it were space occupancy, just being a piece of space. Yes. And it's rather important but curious, he did actually not think, he really did think a piece of space. He didn't think it was just a thing in space because he didn't believe in a vacuum. He really yeah. did think that the whole world was one extended item, and that separate items, the things in it, as we say, tables or whatever, really are local pieces of this in certain states of motion. Now, this is a foundation for the mathematical physics of the 17th century. In its own terms, didn't come off. I mean, eventually, it was going to be replaced by the classical physics and dynamics of Newton, which had a different conception of a mathematical world. But it did a tremendous amount to establish the notion of a physical world which is fundamentally of a mathematical character and permits mathematical physics to be done. Because of course, one of the most important and striking facts about the scientific revolution starting in the period we're discussing in Descartes' lifetime and through his work is that the, the first of the great sciences, as it were, to get going was in fact mathematical physics. Chemistry, the, the, as well, the things that deal with sorts of things in their much more in that kind of detail, is, of course, much more a product of the 18th and 19th century, and not, yeah. not of the 17th century. But wouldn't it be fair to say that Descartes, in his time, did more to launch the possibility of science and to, as it were, sell science to the educated public than anyone else? Yes, I should have thought 
that was probably true. I mean, the figure who was all, also enormously favor, famous, and who's, as a matter of fact, whose actual physics is nearer to classical physics as it came out in the end, is actually Galileo rather than Descartes. But of course, Galileo was more notorious, perhaps, than respectable because he was tried and condemned by the Inquisition and so on. Uh, yes, I mean, Descartes' intellectual influence in this respect was simply enormous, even though the details of his physics were eventually to be in good part repudiated. Yes. Now, up to this point in the argument, what Descartes has shown, Descartes hasn't, as it were, provided us with any physics. No. What he's shown is that a mathematically based physics is possible, is possible yes. and is applicable right. to the real world. Yes. Can you expand on that distinction a little? Yes, absolutely. He, what he hopes to have shown by the maneuvers we've been through, we've followed so far, yeah. is that, as it were, the world is so constructed that man is capable of knowing about I mean, in that sense, man and the world are made for each other by God. There is still a teleological thing at the end in God, even though, of course, man in his essence is not actually part of nature because man is this immaterial intellectual substance which isn't part of the natural yeah. thing. Man is not part of nature in that sense, but he is, as it were, his intellect is quite well adjusted to it. And that means we can conduct a mathematical physics about it. Now, Descartes thought that some of the fundamental physics could themselves be known by what we would call philosophical reflection. He thought in particular we could know by such reflection that every physics had to have a conservation law. There had to be something that was conserved. We talk about the conservation of energy, the conservation of force and so on. Uh, Descartes... The indestructibility of matter, yes, as, it right. to be. as it used to be yes. thought. But of course, yes. now we know the equivalence of matter and energy so, yes, exactly. uh, through mm. atomic reactions and so on. Mm. Now, Descartes actually picked on the quantity that was conserved, something which wasn't what was conserved, and indeed, in terms of classical physics later, is not even well defined. But the idea was there, and that was a priori. It was to be known by reflection. Further details of the laws of physics, he thought, required investigation. And in particular, how the world was actually laid out, how different patterns of motion were to be found in it, he thought was a matter for experimental inquiry. Yes. Now, this is quite important because people, Descartes is rightly said to be a rationalist philosopher. That is, that he thinks that fundamental properties of the world and of the mind and so on can be discovered by reflection, mm -hmm. by a kind of philosophical reflection. And he does not think that everything is just derived from experience or experimental things. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes supposed that he was such a strong rationalist that he thought that the whole of science was to be deduced by purely kind of mathematical or logical reasoning from metaphysics. And if I sat and thought hard enough about the cogito and God and matter and all that, I'd arrive with, with the whole of science. He thought no such thing. In fact, he's absolutely consistent always in saying that experiments are necessary to distinguish between some ways of explaining nature and others. You can build different models. This is very modern, very modern aspect of his thought. You can build as or construct different intellectual models of the world within his laws. Experiment is needed to discover which are truly there. Yes. And is experiment seen by him as designed to test the answers or to give us the material for the premises to our argument? It's designed uh, for a number of different things, actually, but really the following, that if you take the fundamental laws of nature, the principles on which matter moves, there are a lot of different mechanisms you could imagine which would produce superficially the same effect. You then make differential experiments. You then arrange a setup which one thing will happen if one model is what's really there and it won't if another is. And so you select between models. And that really is a quite a good description of quite a lot of what physicists do. Well, fact. it's the modern notion of the crucial or decisive yes. experiment. and he was very keen on that. One of yes. the things that Descartes was admirable about was that it was simply no good blundering around the world, trying out experiments to see what you could find out. Yes. You had to ask the right question. And that's, again, this thing we were saying, well, God is on your side if you do your bit. Yes. God will not allow you to be systematically deceived mm. if you don't systematically deceive yourself. Mm. So yes. what you've got to do is to think of the right questions to ask, and then God will assist nature in yeah. giving you the answer. I think it's worth making the point at this stage in the discussion yeah. that although uh, God is an absolutely indispensable element to Descartes in the course of arriving at his method, once you've got the method, you don't have to be That's any right. sort of believer in That's God right. to use it. No, do that, you? that is an exceedingly important point, that Descartes wanted to free the process of science from theological constraints or foundations, or as one might say, free it from theological foundations and hence from theological interference. Yes. But, of course, he was extremely keen 
say, this does not mean that we've produced a godless world. We've produced a world which is in fact made by God and where our knowledge of it is guaranteed by God. But where you have to appeal by God to God in your intellectual life is not in, as you rightly say, in conducting science, but in proving to skeptics that it can be conducted. And Descartes very sensibly thought, you shouldn't spend a lot of time in proving to skeptics that it can be conducted. You need to do it once. He yes. thought he'd done it. Yes. Now let's all get on with it, yes. with his view. Now, one uh, phrase that's commonly used for an aspect of this whole mm. system that he provided us with is Cartesian dualism. Yes. We've talked about this already. The, you mean the mind-body the, Yes, the, yeah. the, the, the division of total reality yeah. into spirit and matter. Yes. Now, didn't this give him a theoretical problem of a very important yes. kind? How did he explain the interaction? I mean, to put it very crudely, yes. how is a spirit able to push yes. objects in the world around? Yes. Well, I'm afraid, frankly, the answer is that he never really did. I mean, Leibniz, somewhat scornfully, said on this subject, the interaction, said Monsieur Descartes seems to have given up the game so far as we can see. He did have a theory in a late work, just before he went to Sweden, he wrote a book, in which he did curiously try to localize the interaction between mind and body and the pineal gland, which is the body at the base of the brain. But, of course, it barely even makes sense. I mean, the idea that this purely sort of abstract, non-material item, something which is almost, though not quite, as it were, the category of a number, could induce a change in the physical world by redirecting certain animal spirits, which is what he believed, is so difficult to conceive, even in sort of abstract principle, that it was a kind of scandal for everybody. I mean, a lot of the philosophy of the 17th century and indeed subsequently, actually, addressed itself to trying to find some more adequate representation of the relation of mind and body than Descartes actually left us with. Nevertheless, some form of Cartesian dualism, a distinction between yes. observer and observed, subject and object, got into Western thought for something like 400 years. Well, I it? think the distinction between subject and object uh, knower and known is a distinction which is simply impossible for us to do without. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are indeed philosophical systems that constantly try to say that we simply have no conception of the known independently of the knower. Yes. We make up the whole world. And so on. But of course, the trouble about that is that it's very difficult. Um, well, I mean, ab complete idealism, the idea that everything's there is really a product of our minds, is, to put it a little simply, quite difficult to believe. And we all do, and certainly all science does, depend very much on a dualism between the knower and the known, a, a world which we can know independently of our process of knowing it. What I think very few people now assent to is the absolute dualism between a completely pure mind and the body. The, the, the knower has to be seen as indeed, of course, it, it was in philosophy earlier than Descartes, for instance, by St. Thomas or by Aristotle. The knower has to be seen as an essentially embodied creature, him or herself, as it were. I mean, yes. Yes. and not just as a kind of pure soul. Yes. What would you say its main <coughs> uh, influence on Western philosophy has been? Uh, I mean, Descartes' influence yes. has been simply immense, yes. and still is. Well, if we summarize it in one thing, is it is that Descartes, and almost Descartes alone, who brought it about, that the center of Western philosophy for all these centuries has been the theory of knowledge. The idea that philosophy starts from the question, what can I know? Not from the question, just what is there, yeah. or how is the world, but what can I know? And not just what can I know, but what can I know? That is, that it starts from a first personal, egocentric question. And it is very important for the structure of Descartes' system. You know, I mentioned right at the beginning that it was possible in his time to think that perhaps science could even essentially be done by one person. But even if you lay that historical context aside, it is a very important part of his enterprise that it is... It is autobiographical. It's no accident that his two great works, The Discourse on the Method, and above all the meditations, are written in the first person. They are works of self, philosophical self-inquiry. And this first personal and epistemological aspect, that is, the aspect of the theory of knowledge, has been the overwhelming influence of Descartes. Now, given that, that, that all the things <laughs> are wrong with the philosophy yes. that we've yes. touched on, and of course there are more than we have touched yes, on, well. And given that the central concern of philosophy has now moved away from the problem of knowledge, which was made central by Descartes, why is the study of Descartes now as valuable to us as it is? I mean, if I may put this problem yeah. in this question yeah. in a personal yeah. way, you, Bernard Williams, 
you spent, as far as I know, almost 20 years of your life working on a book on Descartes. You must have thought this enormous investment of yes. yourself and your life was worth it. Why? Um, I think for two reasons. I mean, there are, let's lay aside the purely case of historical understanding the role that Descartes has played in getting us into our present situation, where I think that just to know what he said in a little bit of detail is very important simply to understand who we are and where we've come from. But the reason why I think that this book, when I say this book, above all, I mean the particular book called The Meditations, is a book that one very much, if one's interested in philosophy, wants to read now, is because the path it follows, the path of asking what do I know, what can I doubt, and so on, um, is presented in an almost irresistible way. And the point is, it's not an accident that this emphasis in philosophy has been so overwhelmingly important. It isn't that J. Carr, just because he was a dazzling stylist or something of that kind, could kind of perform a long-distance mesmerism on the mind of Europe. That isn't the reason. The reason is because he discovered something which is intrinsically compelling. That is, the idea that I can ask myself, well, I have all these beliefs, but how could I get round behind my beliefs to see if they're really true? How could I stand back from my beliefs to see which of them are prejudices, how much room for there is in skepticism? These are really compelling questions, and it needs an enormous amount of philosophical imagination and work to get oneself out of this very natural pattern of reflection. And another very related question, which comes before you very dramatically in this extraordinarily written book, is not just what can I know? But as we discovered already in the cogito, what am I? We can imagine ourselves. We have this power of imaginative extraction from our actual circumstances. We can imagine ourselves looking out on the world from a different body. We can imagine looking into a mirror and seeing a different face. And what's important, looking into a mirror, seeing a different face and not being surprised. And this gives us the idea, a very, very powerful idea, that I am independent of the body and the past that I have. And that is an absolutely foundational experience of the Cartesian idea, that I am somehow independent of all these materials. Because Cartesian dualism, though, once you look at it, as it were, sideways as a theory, it's immensely difficult to believe for the reasons that we've touched on. It also has the fact that it's almost impossible to resist if you go at it through a certain set of reflections. And I think the set of reflections that Descartes, with unexampled clarity and force, lay before you to lead you down that path, as I think mistaken path, are so not only powerful in themselves, but as it were near to the bone, that it is a, a prime philosophical task to try and arrive at an understanding of oneself, one's imagination, one's conception of what one might be that one would free one of that dualistic problem. Thank you very much.